Once upon a time, at an age far, far away, we had stories told before bed. But something happened. We grew up, and the stories we once loved disappeared. As adults, we might think bedtime stories aren't that important, but studies have shown reading before bed helps with a lot of things. First of all, your stress gets conquered, your creativity comes to save the day, your vocabulary trains for battle, and the mental chatter in your head gets banished. Wordsrated.com has stated, over half of adults haven't read a full book in the past year in 2020. Now, that's a really sad statistic, considering how much benefits reading before sleep has. And that's why we're bringing you guys the Sleepy Time Podcast. What is the Sleepy Time Podcast about? Well, we're here to give young adults the bedtime stories they once had as children. Not only giving you the nostalgia of childhood, but also improving and helping you go to sleep. So, plug in your headphones or turn up your speaker, grab your favorite stuffed animal, and let's get reading. When I decided to do a podcast, I didn't know that there were copyright claims and issues that I would have to deal with. So all these stories are going to be classics, books that are over a hundred years old and in the public domain for people to use and read aloud. So without further ado, let's start. For the first episode of the Sleepy Time podcast, we will be reading The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. This book was published in the late 1800s to early 1900s, and the synopsis really caught my attention, so I feel it is a perfect book to start this podcast off with. It is a short read, but I think it will be a good one. The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, Book 1, Chapter 1. Robert Kahn was once middleweight boxing champion of Princeton. Do not think that I am very much impressed by that as a boxing title, but it meant a lot to Kahn. He cared nothing for boxing. In fact, he disliked it, but he learned it painfully and thoroughly to counteract the feeling of inferiority and shyness he had felt on being treated as a Jew at Princeton. There was a certain inner comfort in knowing he could knock down anybody who was snooty to him. Although, being very shy and a thoroughly nice boy, he never fought, except in the gym. He was Spider Kelly's star pupil. Spider Kelly taught all his young gentlemen to box like featherweights. No matter whether they weighed 105 or 205 pounds. But it seemed to fit Khan. He was really very fast. He was so good that Spider promptly overmatched him and got his nose permanently flattened. This increased Khan's distaste for boxing, but it gave him a certain satisfaction of some strange sort, and it certainly improved his nose. In his last year at Princeton, he read too much and took to wearing spectacles. I never met anyone of his class who remembered him. They did not even remember that he was middleweight boxing champion. I mistrust all frank and simple people, especially when their stories hold together, and I always had a suspicion that perhaps Robert Kahn had never been middleweight boxing champion, and that perhaps a horse had stepped on his face, or that maybe his mother had been frightened or seen something, or that he had, maybe, bumped into something as a young child. But I finally had somebody verify the story from Spider Kelly. Spider Kelly not only remembered Kahn, he had often wondered what had become of him. Robert Kahn was a member, through his father, of one of the richest Jewish families in New York, and through his mother of one of the oldest. At the military school where he prepped for Princeton and played a very good end on the football team, no one had made him race conscience. No one had ever made him feel he was a Jew, and hence any different from anybody else until he went to Princeton. He was a nice boy, a friendly boy, and very shy, and it made him bitter. He took it out in boxing, and he came out of Princeton with painful self-consciousness and the flattened nose. 
and was married by the first girl who was nice to him. He was married five years, had three children, lost most of the $50,000 his father left him, the balance of the estate having gone to his mother, hardened into a rather unattractive mold under domestic unhappiness with a rich wife. And just when he had made up his mind to leave his wife, she left him and went off with a miniature painter. As he had been thinking for months about leaving his wife and had not done it because it would be too cruel to deprive her of himself. Her departure was a very healthful shock. The divorce was arranged and Robert Kahn went out to the coast. In California, he fell among literary people and as he still had a little of the 50,000 left, in a short time, he was backing a review of the arts. The review commenced publication in Carmel, California, and finished in Provincetown, Massachusetts. By that time, Kahn, who had been regarded purely as an angel, and whose name had appeared on the editorial page merely as a member of the advisory board, had become the sole editor. It was his money, and he discovered he liked the authority of editing. He was sorry when the magazine became too expensive and he had to give it up. By that time though, he had other things to worry about. He had been taken in hand by a lady who hoped to rise with the magazine. She was very forceful and Khan never had a chance of not being taken in hand. Also, he was sure that he loved her. When this lady saw that the magazine was not going to rise, she became a little disgusted with Khan and decided that she might as well get what there was to get while there was still something available. So she urged that they go back to Europe, where Khan could write. They came to Europe, where the lady had been educated and stayed three years. During three years, the first spent in travel, the last two in Paris, Robert Khan had two friends, Braddox and myself. Braddox was his literary friend. I was his tennis friend. The lady who had him, her name was Frances, found toward the end of the second year that her looks were going, and her attitude toward Robert changed from one of careless possession and exploitation to the absolute determination that he should marry her. During this time, Robert's mother had settled an allowance on him, about $300 a month. During two years and a half, I do not believe that Robert Kahn looked at another woman. He was fairly happy, except that, like many people living in Europe, he would rather have been in America. He had discovered writing. He wrote a novel, and it was not really such a bad novel as the critics later called it, although it was a very poor novel. He read many books, played bridge, played tennis, and boxed at a local gymnasium. I first became aware of his lady's attitude toward him one night after the three of us had dined together. We had dined at La Venue's and afterward went to the Café de Versailles for coffee. We had several finds after the coffee and I said I must be going. Con had been talking about the two of us going off somewhere on a weekend trip. He wanted to get out of town and get in a good walk. I suggested we fly to Strasbourg and walk up to saint Odile or somewhere or other in Alsace. I know a girl in Strasbourg who can show us the town, I said. Somebody kicked me under the table. I thought it was accidental and went on. She's been there two years and knows everything there is to know about the town. She's a swell girl. I was kicked again under the table and, looking, saw Frances, Robert's lady, her chin lifting and her face hardening. Hell, I said, why go to Strasbourg? We could go up to Brogs or to the Ardennes. Con looked relieved. I was not kicked again. I said goodnight and went out. Con said he wanted to buy a paper and would walk to the corner with me. For God's sake, he said. Why did you say that about that girl in Strasbourg for? Didn't you see Frances? No, why should I? If I know an American girl that lives in Strasbourg, what the hell is it to Frances? It doesn't make any difference. Any girl, I couldn't go. That would be all. Don't be silly. You don't know Frances. Any girl at all. Didn't you see the way she looked? Oh well, I said. Let's go to Saint-Lys. Don't get sore. I'm not sore. 
Sonlis is a good place, and we can stay at the Grand Kerf and take a hike in the woods and come home. Good, that will be fine. Well, I'll see you tomorrow at the courts, I said. Good night, Jake, he said, and started back to the cafe. You forgot to get your paper, I said. That's so. He walked with me up to the kiosk at the corner. You are not sore, are you, Jake? He turned with the paper in his hand. No, why should I be? See you at tennis, he said. I watched him walk back to the cafe holding his paper. I rather liked him, and evidently she led him quite a life. So, in this first chapter, we find out who the narrator is, and it is Robert Kahn's friend, Jake. So, Jake is his tennis player friend, and they are at a dinner, and you kind of just find out that Francis is very clingy towards Robert, and they might be having marital issues, but we're not really quite there yet. That has not been revealed to us completely. All we know is that Robert seems to not want to stay in Paris anymore, and we'll see where things go from there. Chapter 2 That winter, Robert Kahn went over to America with his novel, and it was accepted by a fairly good publisher. His going made an awful row I heard, and I think that was where Francis lost him because several women were nice to him in New York, and when he came back, he was quite changed. He was more enthusiastic about America than ever, and he was not so simple, and he was not so nice. The publishers had praised his novel pretty highly, and it rather went to his head. Then, several women had put themselves out to be nice to him, and his horizons had all shifted. For four years, his horizon had been absolutely limited to his wife. For three years, or almost three years, he had never seen beyond Francis. I am sure he had never been in love in his life. He had married on the rebound from the rotten time he had in college, and Francis took him in on that rebound from his discovery that he had not been everything to his first wife. He was not in love yet. But he realized that he was an attractive quantity to women, and that the fact of a woman caring for him and wanting to live with him was not simply a divine miracle. This changed him so that he was not so pleasant to have around. Also, playing for higher stakes than he could afford in some rather steep bridge games with his New York connections. He had held cards and won several hundred dollars. It made him rather vain of his bridge game and he talked several times of how a man could always make a living at bridge, if he were ever forced to. Then there was another thing. He had been reading W. H. Hudson. That sounds like an innocent occupation, but Khan had read and reread The Purple Land. The Purple Land is a very sinister book, if read too late in life. It recounts splendid imagery, amorous adventures of a perfect English gentleman in an intensely romantic land, the scenery of which is very well described. For a man to take it at 34 as a guidebook to what life holds is as about as safe as it would be for a man of the same age to enter Wall Street direct from a French convent, equipped with the complete set of the more practical Olger books. Khan, I believe, took every word of the purple land as literary, as though it had been an R.G. Dunn report. You understand me. He made some reservations, but on the whole, the book to him was sound. It was all that was needed to set him off. I did not realize the extent to which it had set him off until one day he came into my office. Hello, Robert, I said. Did you come in to cheer me up? Would you like to go to South America, Jake? He asked. No. Why not? I don't know. I never wanted to go. Too expensive. You can see all the South Americans you want in Paris anyway. They're not the real South Americans. They look awfully real to me. I had a boat train to catch with a week's mail stories, and only half of them written. Do you know any dirt? I asked. No. None of your exalted connections getting divorces? No. Listen, Jake. If I handled both our expenses, would you go to South America with me? Why me? 
You can talk Spanish, and it would be more fun with the two of us. No, I said. I like this town, and I go to Spain in the summertime. All my life, I've wanted to go on a trip like that, Con said. He sat down. I'll be too old before I can ever do it. Don't be a fool, I said. You can go anywhere you want. You've got plenty of money. I know, but I can't get started. Cheer up, I said. All countries look just like the moving pictures. But I felt sorry for him. He had it badly. I can't stand to think my life is going so fast and I'm not really living it. Nobody ever lives their life all the way up except bullfighters. I'm not interested in bullfighters. That's an abnormal life. I want to go back in the country in South America. We could have a great trip. Did you ever think about going to British East Africa to shoot? No, I wouldn't like that. I'd go there with you. No, that doesn't interest me. That's because you never read a book about it. Go on and read a book all full of love affairs with the beautiful shiny black princesses. I want to go to South America. He had a hard, Jewish, stubborn streak. Come on downstairs and have a drink. Aren't you working? No, I said. We went down the stairs to the cafe on the ground floor. I had discovered that was the best way to get rid of friends. Once you had a drink, all you had to say was, well, I've got to get back and get off some cables, and it was done. It is very important to discover graceful exits like that in the newspaper business, where it is such an important part of the ethics that you should never seem to be working. Anyway, we went downstairs to the bar and had a whiskey and soda. Con looked at the bottles and bins round the wall. This is a good place, he said. There's a lot of liquor, I agreed. Listen, Jake, he leaned forward on the bar. Don't you ever get that feeling that all your life is going by and you're not taking advantage of it? Do you realize you've lived nearly half the time you have to live already? Yes, every once in a while. Do you know that in about 35 years more we'll be dead? What the hell, Robert? I said. What the hell? I'm serious. It's one thing I don't worry about, I said. You ought to. I've had plenty to worry about one time or other. I'm through worrying. Well, I want to go to South America. Listen, Robert, going to another country doesn't make any difference. I've tried all that. You can't get away from yourself by moving from one place to another. There's nothing to that. But you've never been to South America. South America, hell. If you went there the way you feel now, it would be exactly the same. This is a good town. Why don't you start living your life in Paris? I'm sick of Paris. And I'm sick of the quarter. Stay away from the quarter. Cruise around by yourself and see what happens to you. Nothing happens to me. I walked alone all one night and nothing happened except a bicycle cop stopped me and asked to see my papers. Wasn't the town nice that night? I don't care for Paris. So there you were. I was sorry for him, but it was not a thing you could do anything about because right away you ran up against the two stubbornnesses South America could fix it, and he did not like Paris. He got the first idea out of a book, and I suppose the second came out of a book too. Well, I said, I've got to go upstairs and get off some cables. Do you really have to go? Yes, I've got to get these cables off. Do you mind if I come up and sit around the office? No, come on up. He sat in the outer room and read the papers, and the editor and publisher and I worked hard for two hours. Then I sorted out the carbons, stamped on a byline, put the stuff in a couple of big manila envelopes and rang for a boy to take them to the Gar St. Lazar. I went out into the other room and there was Robert Kahn asleep in the big chair. He was asleep with his head on his arms. I did not like to wake him up, but I wanted to lock the office and shove off. I put my hand on his shoulder. He shook his head. I can't do it, he said. 
and put his head deeper into his arms. I can't do it. Nothing will make me do it. Robert, I said, and shook him by the shoulder. He looked up. He smiled and blinked. Did I talk out loud just then? Something, but it wasn't clear. God, what a rotten dream. Did the typewriter put you to sleep? Guess so. I didn't sleep all last night. What was the matter? Talking, he said. I could picture it. I have a rotten habit of picturing the bedroom scenes of my friends. We went out to the Café Napolitan to have an aperitif and watch the evening crowd on the boulevard. And with that, chapter two comes to an end. So we do find out that him and Francis are having quite some marital issues in their relationship. We find out that Robert kind of wants to dip out of Paris. He's sick of it. He's tired. And he wants some adventure in his life. Maybe Robert's going through a midlife crisis. I can totally understand when he says he's bored of the place he's in. But I'm surprised he would say that about Paris, since right now it's one of the most richest cities to live in in the world. This episode isn't that long, but I want to keep it short for the first time because I want to see how you guys like it. Tell me if there's anything that you guys need me to improve on, anything you want to hear. By now, you should all be fast asleep. So, thank you for listening to the Sleepy Time Podcast, and have a very good night.